just like being there. That's what we want to do in preservation. We want to preserve the experience that people had. Um, but what needs to be preserved to do that? Well, here's some ancient cuneiform tablet. There's a very large collection of this at the New York Public Library. And what's interesting is that most of them are things like a receipt for nine dead sheep and two dead goats, um, or how much somebody paid for a house, or a request to provide some reed mats for the janitors. So uh, rather than preserving some pronouncement of the king or some beautiful ancient Sumerian artwork from 5,000 years ago, we know a lot about Sumerian culture because of this mundane stuff. People might be more interested in the preservation of the supermarket receipt than the Liechtenstein stuff that's in the museum here. Now, I'm going to talk a bit about opera because I'm involved in opera. Uh, what is opera? I don't know. But I know what the word means. The Latin for opus means work, so opera is the plural of opus, and it's because there's lots of works involved in opera, singing and instrumental music and storytelling and so on. But perceptions have changed about opera and what's important about it over the years. These days, we talk about an opera always by the name of the composer. So it's Bizet's Carmen, Britten's Peter Grimes, Mozart's Don Giovanni, and so on. Here's uh, the poster for the opening of Sandrion, and it's Massenet's Sandrion, very clearly. But here's what some people call the first opera, uh, this was performed in Florence in what the Florentines called 1597 and uh, what we call 1598. And we have a libretto here or a small book of the text of the opera. And uh, that was um, given out as a favor. It was performed at a rich person's palazzo. And notice that in fairly large letters, it tells who wrote the text of the libretto a poet by the name of Ottavio Rinuccini, um, but you can barely make out the name of the composer there, Jacopo Corsi, uh, not very important. Now, notice that because this was a rich person's favor, it's beautifully printed, there's no bleed through or anything like that. That's what we call the first libretto. We don't know anything about the music of this opera because the music wasn't preserved. It wasn't considered important. Here's the second libretto, same opera, but uh, the... Um, person decided that he could make some money perhaps by selling the libretto, so he printed them up, but much cheaper. You can see the bleed through on that. Now, over the years, this is a uh, scenic design by the stage designer and engineer. I like him because he's an engineer, uh, Giacobo uh, Torelli. In Paris, people used to go to operas because they were Torelli's operas. So this is his design for Andromed, and uh, he would have people flying in and out and sets that could change in a few seconds and so on. Uh, people might go to an opera because it was Zeffirelli's production. Franco Zeffirelli was the director and scenic designer in many. People might go to an opera because a particular singer was in it or a particular conductor or a particular company was doing it or it was a particularly beautiful location, uh, Verona or something like that. Uh, or we have this situation where recently the Royal Opera here uh, came out with Carmen, and what's the second largest text on the poster? The viewing technology, 3D. Now, at least you can't quite make it out because of the blow up here, but uh, on the right side over there, it does have the names of two of the principal characters, but it doesn't say anything else. Um, now, here's another poster. And this is a plea for the importance of metadata. I'm not sure if you're all familiar with the term metadata. It's the data about the data, the label, if you will. So here is a poster for Rosabelle Morrison's production of Carmen. This is considered a very important production because it introduced movies to many people. There was an actual film of a bullfight in this production in 1896. Um, so the current identification of this is that it was Bizet's Carmen. Bizet wrote the opera Carmen, and so this is Bizet's Carmen with Rosabelle Morrison in it. And to prove that, here is the Wikipedia entry, and uh, notice it says that this won a star, it was picture of the day, and their description, it's poster for an 1896 production of George Bizet's Carmen starring Rosabelle Morrison and so on. Uh, well, we all know Wikipedia is unimpeachable, but nevertheless, here are some other sources. This is uh, the San Francisco Opera's 
opera education site and same poster as you can see and they say it's a poster for Bizet's Carmen. You can find many academic documents um, from UCLA, um, various American universities, some others because of this movie saying that this was Bizet's Carmen. Unfortunately, it wasn't. It wasn't an opera at all. It was a play. Uh, yes, it was Rosabelle Morrison performing in Carmen, but as the New York Dramatic Mirror points out, um, it has many features that have nothing to do with the opera and have been strangely omitted in other adaptations, possibly because the opera has usually been taken for a model instead of the original tale. So because nobody wrote on that poster that it wasn't Bizet's Carmen, and we most often associate Carmen with the opera today, everyone thinks it's Bizet's Carmen. This was uh, an early proposal for transmediation of opera. Uh, the idea was you would have an acoustic duct that would take the opera outside the opera house and you could have a plaza cast, not particularly successful. Um, perhaps the most successful transmediation was writing down the text of the opera in the little book, uh, the libretto, that works very well and we have those preserved. Here is another transmediation. This was done by P.T. Barnum of the circus and this way to the egress and so on. And his proposal was to take performances from the Paris Opera and send them by telephone line across the Atlantic to New York, where he would charge $5 an act in 1887, which would be about 120 US dollars in today's money per act, or roughly $500 for an opera. That's a lot of money. So people could have said, that's a stupid idea because who's gonna pay $500? or they could have said, that's a stupid idea because the sound of the opera after it gets through a telephone line uh, crossing the Atlantic is gonna be terrible, but instead, the electrician and the electrical engineer says, well, performances at the Paris Opera depend largely for their success on the scenery and the ballet. The singer's not ranking very high. So that's why they thought it was a terrible idea. Nevertheless, opera sound only media really took off. Uh, the world's first live stereo network was for opera. Uh, the first live radio broadcast of operas in 1910, the first million selling record is this one, sorry, not the first, but the earliest recorded. Uh, the first was actually country music. Um, the first pay cable system in 1885 was for opera. The first stereo sound transmission in 1881 was for opera. The first electronic home entertainment was for opera. And it was described as just like being there back in 1880. Can't see anything, but it's just like being there. Even earlier, uh, Edison came up with the phonograph in 1877. In 1878, we have this opera singer singing an aria into the phonograph. But there was an earlier aria that was recorded in 1860, that's 17 years before Edison's phonograph. It was recorded, but it was never intended to be played back. It was recorded on a system for analyzing sound called the phonautograph. Nevertheless, recently, using technology developed at Lawrence Berkeley Laboratories, they have been able to play it back. And you can go to the site firstsounds.org and listen to many recordings from 1860. And there was playback well before that. This is a uh, device that was built perhaps in 1731 called the microcosm, a large clock, but with a musical instrument inside it. And it played music from eight different Handel operas. Uh, Handel wrote specifically for mechanical playback devices. Here's one. So she's playing an aria from Armid um, on a hammered dulcimer that was made in 1784 and was given to Marie Antoinette. It looked like her, she didn't like that, so she gave it to the French Academy of Sciences, which is why we have it today. If she had it in her possession, it likely would have been destroyed. But there have been mechanical music systems since at least 9th century Baghdad. So there have been recorded music, if you will, uh, systems for quite some time, uh, extant ones back to 1480, roughly. This is one that's in the UK, uh, also plays some nice opera music. Here's uh, another system. Uh, 
Uh, this is the first disc playback system. It's a mechanical disc, a, a metallic steel disc with holes um, made in it, and the pieces from the holes were left there so that they would pluck things. Um, the phonograph disc eventually took over for the phonograph cylinder, um, but the Edison cylinder had a head start of about 13 years and was eventually overtaken by Victor Discs. Now, the reason that the Discs overtook it was uh, there were many reasons for it. Some were related to promotion. Some were related to replication. It was difficult to make copies of cylinders, uh, much easier to make copies of Discs. But because it was difficult to make copies of cylinders, they would record as many cylinders at one time as possible, which means that today, using new technology, we can recreate stereo from two different old cylinders if we can get hold of it. Um, but back in the old days, even if they knew that they were recording stereo, they had no way of making it. You may have seen recently some discussion of uh, the earliest recording of Alexander Graham's voice, Graham Bell's voice that was played back. It was played back from an 1885 wax disc that was not in particularly good condition, but using similar technology to what played back the phonautograph at Lawrence Berkeley Laboratories, they were able to play it back. They even played back this wax disc, which as you can see is in horrendous shape, and yet they were able to play it back. But there's an earlier earliest. This 1885 is called now the earliest, but um, here is a story from the New York Times in 1937 talking about playback of an 1881 record made by Bell. Now, here's an interesting issue about preservation. By the way, there's a great play at the National Theater right now called People by Alan Bennett, and it's about archiving and what should be preserved and at what level it should be preserved. Um, but this is Tom Stockham. Some of you may know him as one of the investigators of the 18 and a half minute Watergate gap uh, for President Nixon. Um, he came up with some mathematical processing to remove the effects of the horn from Caruso's voice so we could finally hear what Caruso sounded like. And he released this recording, Caruso, a legendary performer, with the true voice of Caruso rather than the mechanically recorded voice of Caruso. And the record did not do very well um, because apparently people liked the mechanical sound of Caruso's voice. In fact, he was hired by the Metropolitan Opera based on one of his recordings. Well, when Edison got into the disc business, he said, okay, I've got to prove that my discs are better than anyone else's discs. And so he created what he called tone tests. And uh, these tone tests would be either in small areas where people would be blindfolded and a singer would sing or a phonograph would be played. Um, or in large areas, they would do it, say, on the stage of a concert hall and turn out the lights and then the lights would come back on and people wouldn't see the singer, only the phonograph. And here it is, the result, and no one could tell the difference. Now that's an Edison ad, but in fact, here is a report in the Pittsburgh Post, um, someone saying it did not seem difficult to determine in the dark when the singer sang and when she did not. Ryder himself was pretty sure about it until the lights were turned on and it was discovered that the singer was not on the stage at all and the new Edison alone had been heard. Now, we think, this is crazy. How could you not tell the difference between a live singer and a mechanical phonograph playback? But in fact, it was so new to people that anything could be played back. They had not yet built up the perceptual uh, talent to tell that difference. Today we can tell the difference, but back then they couldn't. But I should point out that this is one of the singers who was used in the tone tests, Anna Case. And she confessed in 1972 that she had trained herself to sound like a phonograph recording. <laughs> now here is one of the earliest um, motion picture presentations, at least before a paying audience. This is the arrival of the train at the station of La Ciotat. And um, there's a famous story that someone was freaked out and thought that the train was going to run her over. Uh, well, here you can see what she was seeing. It's black and white. It's silent. The train is not even heading at the screen. And yet this was something new and it was just too exciting and she couldn't sit down until after the locomotive had passed by. Um, so what 
experience do we want to convey with our AV um, preservation? Well, baseball games were transmitted by telegraph to various systems that were essentially scoreboards, but with some extra elements. This one had a regulation size ball, and it could be moved on wires to any part of the field. And uh, the first of these systems was used in 1884. By 1886, the Detroit Free Press was pronouncing that it was just as on a ball field. The people in the audience were cheering and applauding uh, because it was just like being there. 1919, people talked about a system talk like just like being there. That's well before television. Um, now, maybe some of that is because there was a crowd. Here are 70,000 people gathered to watch this particular system in 1911. Uh, that's 20,000 people more that were, than were in the ballpark watching the actual ball game at the same time. Uh, the Metropolitan Opera has been very successful with its transmission of operas to cinemas. And uh, the first ones we did were in 1952. Uh, we're doing them currently. Currently, we're doing them in high definition with surround sound, uh, subtitles, and so on. But in both cases, in 1952 and currently, it was highly rated and there was applause in the cinema, even though there was no one performing in the cinema to hear the applause. So why is this? Well, again, partly the crowd sense. If you're in a room with other people, then even in 1952, if you're seeing things that are just black and white, um, low definition, uh, mono sound that's worse than AM radio quality, that's still fine. Um, but another factor is you paid money, and in 1952 you paid the equivalent of $60 today to go see this in the cinema. Today you're paying $22, but you have to spend the effort, you have to get a babysitter perhaps, take the time. If you're doing all that, you have a cognitive dissonance issue if you don't like it. Then you were stupid to spend that time and money, but you don't want to be stupid, therefore it must have been good. But home and personal media are different. If we present the opera on an iPhone, that's not the same as presenting it in the theater, even if we're delivering it with even better quality. Now, how much quality should we deliver it with? Well, here I have a poster of The Hobbit because The Hobbit was released in a new technology, a higher frame rate, and it was not universally beloved. Um, there have been conflicting opinions about many advances in technology, from high resolution, widescreen sound, color, stereoscopic 3D, uh, greater contrast, and so on. So here's some of the conflicting opinions. Edison, by the way, when he started working on motion pictures, which he said he was doing for opera, uh, was at 46 frames per second. That's almost the same as The Hobbit's 48. But at the same time, Wordsworth Donisthorpe over here in the UK was working on a system at eight frames per second. And uh, Electricity Magazine said, well, you know, considering the brain can only retain an impression for a seventh of a second, eight is more than enough and the other 38 are a waste. Uh, the director, Doug Trumbull, in 1994 said 60 was too high for traditional fiction storytelling, 24 was good. Uh, in 2012, he said, oh, we should go to 120 for profound immersion. High dynamic range. This is a test rig that Dolby set up to see how much contrast people really want to see. And the only way they can do it is by actually having people look into the lens of a theatrical projector. Um, they do have this moderation by the LCD screen over there, and it's normally all covered with black cloth, so all you can see is the picture. So Dolby's experiments yielded a result that people would like to see as much as 20,000 nits of brightness for their highest brightness. But at the exact same event where that information was released, the Hollywood Post Alliance Tech Retreat this past February, uh, Real D did a demonstration and they showed a 1969 movie at various brightnesses, and the seeming audience preference was for 72. There's a huge difference between 72 and 20,000, and yet those were two different preferences that were discussed. Stereoscopic 3D um, was patented in 1852 for movies. Uh, the first theatrical audience saw it in 1915. This is a 1922 um, active shutter system. 
uh, not been terribly successful, even though it comes and goes and comes and goes and comes and goes. First television broadcast, 1928. Do we need a glasses-free system? Do we need to go to holography? Or is it perhaps too real? Is it something that we don't want to have? Uh, color. Well, of course we want to have color, don't we? And yet here is uh, Jean Renoir saying uh, cinema is black and white. Why photograph other colors? And Francois Truffaut saying that color has done as much damage to cinema as has television. And which color? You may have seen this recently. This is from uh, the Van Gogh Museum in uh, Amsterdam. This is our traditional view of the bedroom, but they recently discovered by using modern technology that this is probably what it looked like when Van Gogh uh, painted it. Very, very different colors. These are the limitations of any three primary color system. We have to have some sort of triangle in here, which means we can never reproduce the very saturated uh, blue-green colors, which are pretty important for art. Uh, so what do we photograph them with? If we use any existing television or digital cinema camera, we don't get that uh, saturated blue-green, but we could go to a different camera that has four color primaries or five color primaries or six. Now this is the earliest known existing sound movie. Now, I can say today that's the earliest known existing sound movie. If I were speaking to you 10 years ago, I couldn't because no one had found the cylinder that matched that movie yet and no one had synchronized it. Walter Birch did the synchronization so that we know that that's the earliest existing sound movie. Of course, there may be an earlier one out there that no one has yet found the cylinder or the recording for and that no one has yet synchronized the sound to. Um, but if that was synchronized sound in 1894 or 1895, why did it take until 1927 to get to what we call the sound era? And the reason I have an asterisk by the 1927 is we usually date the sound era from the jazz singer. Uh, well, here's an intertitle from the jazz singer. Uh, the sort of thing that you would see in a silent movie, because the jazz singer was made as a sort of silent movie. Much of it was not synchronized sound. But here are some other silent movies that were um, released before the jazz singer. And in this one, you can see a little rhomboid up there. Those are lights that would light up to tell musicians in the cinema to start singing or start performing. In this one, you can see a little... Um, picture here of a conductor who's actually conducting the singers and musicians in the cinema. And this is the most complicated system. This one has a score, whoops, moving backwards on the bottom of the screen uh, with an arrow to show the musicians where it is. The reason it's backwards is the singers were behind the screen, so they wouldn't interfere with the performers in front. So what kind of sound do we need to preserve? How many channels? I'm being recorded right now, but I have only one microphone on. You're not hearing me in stereo. You're not hearing me in surround sound. Do we need a wave field to recreate things? There was an opera that was performed last year with an 80 loudspeaker wave field in 3D sound. There are conflicting opinions even on shape. Whenever we go to a cinema today, we see a shape that's uh, horizontally rectangular. But in 1930, the great director, Sergei Eisenstein, uh, argued for something that he called the dynamic square, which would be whatever shape was appropriate to a scene. And he said, it is my desire to intone the hymn of the male, the strong, the virile, active, vertical composition. Higher resolution dates back at least to the uh, exposition in Paris in, in uh, 1900. Uh, this is the Lumieres. That's the size of their screen. Those are two people standing in front of it. And so they went to very large 60-millimeter uh, wide frames, uh, just as IMAX is today. Uh, times have changed. We talk about high-definition television. This is a report to the UK Parliament in 1935 uh, talking about high-definition television and saying that's definitely what they should transmit. And their definition of it was it should be no less than 240 lines. 
today we call standard definition, 625 lines. Now, some of our research into definition is based on the idea of visual acuity. Well, you've probably seen this eye chart developed by a uh, Dutch ophthalmologist in 1862 uh, called a Snellen chart, and the characters on these are called optotypes, and if you have normal vision, then every feature of the optotype subtends one minute of arc. Uh, there's 60 minutes in one degree, and that's for either what we Americans call 2020 vision or Europeans call 6 6 vision, normal vision. But um, at what's called the Lechner distance or the Jackson distance, the normal television viewing distance based on the size of living rooms. Um, you really can't see more than standard definition on a 25-inch screen if you have that perfect vision, the 2020 or the 66. But is that really accurate? Here's the eye chart again, and notice that there are three lines down below the 2020. And recent research in Japan has shown that young people tend to have at least 2010 vision, if not even better than that. Uh, furthermore, here we have this nice, very sharp E, and we're defining things based on one arc minute. Well, that's what things would look like if we were only transmitting that frequency, and that's what the E would look like. To get sharp edges, you need to add harmonics of the frequency to get up to a, a higher frequency. So there may be advantages to high definition. Um, does everyone see a sort of U shape under there? Anyone not see a sort of U shape? Okay, I'll take that as a yes. Uh, there's none there. That's your visual system putting it in. This is called a contrast sensitivity function, and it's kind of like, if you may be familiar with Fletcher-Munson curves for sound, we are less sensitive to contrast at low frequencies and at high frequencies, and most sensitive to contrast at medium frequencies. Uh, this will be very difficult for you to see here, but when you download the slides, you can walk away from your computer screen and see it. Here we have an angry person on the left and a neutral looking person on the right. And some of you, particularly in the back row, might see it reversed in this one. To me, it looks exactly the same in this one. Um, you will see the pictures reversed when you walk away from your computer screen, just based on the contrast sensitivity of human vision. What should we record when we're doing performing arts? Do we want to have one camera shooting a proscenium-wide thing, or do we want to have multiple cameras? Here is a camera plot from one of our Metropolitan Opera productions. There's 10 cameras shooting the opera in this case in various locations. Some of them are blocking seats. But here is a European Union project called Project Fine, for free view immersive networked experience, where by using just a few cameras, they can recreate the space of an area, whether it's an athletic stadium or it's an opera house or a theater, and allow people of the future to be able to zoom in on something, go behind, see what was going on uh, at another part. So can future technology come to the rescue? Um, well, here's some things that were introduced again at the World's Fair in Paris in 1900. Uh, they had infinite aspect ratio. This was a system called the uh, Cineorama, where you could see 360 degrees around. There was a motion platform ride, the Mario-Rama, where you could get motion sickness because it was bouncing back and forth. There was an angular velocity-based 3D experience, the Trans-Siberian Express. Uh, three synchronized sound theaters, magnetic sound playback. This is a poster for one of the sync sound theaters. These were all available more than 100 years ago, and most have not survived today. What else? What about Smellovision? This is um, a movie introduced by Mike Todd in 1959, Scent of Mystery. Uh, here's a movie behind the Great Wall in Aroma Rama. Here was a movie released in Percepto. It was called The Tingler, and it would give you a little sensation at your spine in certain seats. Um, what about palatal sensation, the ability to taste something? There may come a time when we shall have smelly vision and tasty vision, when we're able to broadcast so that all the senses are catered for. We shall live in a world which no one has yet dreamt about. Very true. So what's my conclusion? 
We don't know what the future will want. Will they want my supermarket receipt or will they want the Liechtenstein? Uh, we don't know what the future will perceive because perception is learned. We don't know what future technology will be able to do. We don't have infinite resources, so best wishes to us all. Thank you.